Welcome to the weekly Threat Insights group discussion. We have a few items on our agenda today. We'll just jump right in. Aviel, you have the top one. So um, basically, this is just a quick update about the vulnerability history feature. Uh, there's nothing that I didn't write down. I think um, the back end was merged yesterday, but since it's late in the release, um, I, I don't want to expect, I want to set the expectation that it probably won't get in for 13 So. Savash does not feel pressured by that. Um, and caching still needs to be implemented. That's something the database team wants us to do to take pressure off of this heavy query. Um, that's a significant chunk of work of its own. So I'm going to make another issue for that and um, drop it in the backlog. And that's it. Thanks, Avia. Cool. Avia, um, would you say that, so it sounds like the caching is going to be a blocker getting that through the maintainer team, um, which would imply we're not going to get that particular component backed by standalone vulnerabilities until it's in place? Uh, fortunately, in this case, no. It's already the query and all the back end is already merged, which is where they would have stopped it. It's something they asked us to do as we go through this process. So we could casually forget about it right now if we wanted to, but you know, in the spirit of fairness, we probably shouldn't. I was actually going the other direction with it. I was going to say, instead of the backlog, would you mind just putting it uh, for 13.1. That sounds like something that would be a good candidate to tackle sooner so we don't forget about it. Okay, I'll do that. Just to reiterate, uh, given that Aviel's work's just completed and Savash is still working on it, the odds of us getting this report back on the dashboard for 13.0 is low, Matt. So um, even even without the caching, it sounds like we're, we're at risk of being oh, able to deliver no, no, no. this report. I mean the caching specifically as a follow-up right. just so we have that visibility. Cool. And whoever updated the issue status, the health status to at risk, thank you. Very helpful. I started doing that because it's fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> Aviel has a different interpretation of fun than some people do, uh, but that's okay. I get, I, get, I get it though. It's like you achieved something. So I didn't do it, but at least I set a flag here. Exactly. I was hoping I would get fun colors, like a yellow or something, but I don't think that's implemented yet. Someday. All right, great. Thanks, Aviel. Um, I added the second agenda item. It was uh, brought up today that we didn't update the documentation for the, the dashboard specifically. We have documentation around the standalone page. We have documentation around the export feature, but the dashboards themselves still reflect old screenshots. So I'm working with Nick to correct that. My kind of reason for bringing this up was one, to ask to get confirmation that some of this text was still correct. So this is more of a, a process question on how vulnerabilities, uh, sorry, so uh, the, the verbiage on the project level says the dashboard displays the latest security reports for your project from the last successful pipeline. Is that correct anymore? I think that was only true when these were findings based dashboards. Is that correct? We retain history now. They are standalone objects that persist over time. That is even what? Okay, yeah. so this verbiage needs to change then. Um, whether we remove it or, or what, I'll, I'll work with, with Nick on that. I just wanted to ensure that my understanding is correct. Now that we've moved to standalone vulnerabilities, uh, we're looking at more of a historical representation of vulnerabilities, whereas findings was just a snapshot of what was on master uh, at the last successful run. I see. I see some nodding. Okay. I never want to assume hey, that I understand things. Go ahead, Andy. You could say um, the dashboard is updated on the last successful run. Um, oh, that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then my last observation was that is that, you know, e Later down in this agenda, Savash shared us a demo of adding the project filters to the dashboards that are missing. I'm going to kind of drag my heels. And I wish Wayne had his video on so I could watch the reaction on his face when I say this. Um, <laughs> as opposed to having to repeat this process multiple times, my hope was to wait a couple of days to update this documentation uh, in the screenshots to capture some of the last work that we're trying to get in for 13.0. Is there any concerns around that? Um, no. You okay with that There's the, um, and users are going to click on the document, you know, who, 
I don't know what our uptake on user uh, of users actually reading the documentation. In general, you know, that's relatively low in any product. But you know, when the documentation isn't there, uh, then users, when they need it or want it, then they get really frustrated. The main standalone vulnerabilities page is in you know is in pretty good shape. The dashboard still has the old dashboards in it, um, which I know you know we we didn't ask Nick to look at that until just a couple hours ago. So thanks, Nick, for starting to look at it. But um, you know we we definitely don't expect that in in 13.0. Um, so I don't think it needs to be perfect, and any of the documentation needs to be perfect. I, I think we iteratively improve it and. If it's more effort, okay. Do it multiple times, and that's not worth the value we get out of it. You like, you know, multiple iterations of screenshots. So be it. Yeah, and I'm just talking about like until tomorrow. You know, some of the work yeah. that I'm referring to is going to staging today. I can capture it on staging. We can get the screenshots out uh, prior to to 13 to launch it. I just know that now customers are starting to see this in the dashboard, so I don't want to wait yeah. too long. So what does everybody else think? I say we wait until tomorrow. All right. Thanks. Uh, Nick and I will follow up on that and share in the uh, Thread Insights room. There's a few demos. If anyone had an opportunity to, I, I got to watch them. I did try to put some notes in here um, around a couple of items that Savash was referring to that he'd like some feedback on from a UX perspective. So I think, um, Andy, if you have had a chance to look at these, um, what are your thoughts on? So to, to summarize, the first one was around the project drop-down filter um, and adding that back to the instance level and group level dashboards. And I think his first observation was because the projects that have vulnerabilities, uh, the data loads a little bit later that you initially just see the filter that says all projects and it takes a couple of seconds to populate with the projects that you can filter on. So that was the first observation that Savash had. I'm kind of looking at Andy to see if he thinks we need to create urgent tickets for any of these or I don't think it's urgent. I mean, there's there's enough signals in the UI to allow people to know that something's happening and something will happen. It's definitely room for improvement, but I think based on category maturity and all the other things in the backlog, I, I don't think anybody's gonna like flip the card table over proverbially <laughs> and seeing it loading. <laughs> Okay, and then the, the second one seemed a little bit more urgent, but I'm assuming it's also in that same category. If you select a project that doesn't have vulnerabilities that match your filter, the message displays something very generic. And I know we have another um, issue around that in general, just improving that error handling. Um, but so I don't know, Andy, if you want to think about what that, that should look like. Yeah, I was going to update that issue. Savash had a really good recommendation of just saying like projects plural as opposed to talking about the group vulnerabilities, which, yeah, I think empty states, if you ever dove into them, there, there's plenty to fix there. So um, I can see if that seats nicely with some of the empty state work going on. Awesome. And then there was two other demos that he shared. Uh, Andy shared some feedback. Savash isn't here, so I'm hoping he'll get to. Uh, watch this video. Andy, go ahead and elaborate on. So you noticed that the remediated badges didn't appear in the dashboards. Yeah, and that just could be due to how Svash was showing us like the proof of concept for the alert persisting within the vulnerability page itself. Um, but the badge should show on vulnerabilities that have been resolved in master and their state is no longer detected. Um, so by clicking on a vulnerability to do the proof of concept for the um, alert, that vulnerability from the list view should have had that badge. But I can also see how in a roundabout way it could be just testing in something easy, right? I don't know, code. Um, so. We'll have to look at this. You know, we've had some conversations recently around the remediations. I've personally never seen this badge on the new dashboards. I'm not sure I'm kind of looking Alexander or Aviel. Uh, I'm assuming this wasn't done by Mark, just targeting the old pre-GraphQL dashboards in 1210, but that's a big assumption. So I think we're gonna have to confirm that 
you know, we're still supporting this with the new vulner standalone vulnerability back dashboards. Yeah, and that's a pretty unique testing case, right? So you have to have the vulnerability and you have to then remove it and then like make sure it's not marked as resolved, right? So and then something there. Okay, so we'll have to follow up on this one. Mm -hmm. Thanks for calling it out though. All right, before we move on to planning breakdown, did anyone else have anything to demo or discussions that we kind of breezed past? All right. So we have three items here for planning breakdown. Matt, I'm gonna let you speak to, or Andy, one of you guys, at least this first one. Yes, so um, preparing for this, it's a, like an issue icon with a check, box, check in it. I'm pre getting prepared for us as a, you know, company removing that or deprecating that. So we can just go with the standard issue open. Um, a nice to have would be able to render the issue closed if an issue is closed. So that would be fantastic. Does anyone on this call know we've already got the issue links displaying in the dashboards or is this time to work that uh, we've already, we've still got queued up? I do not know. Okay. I have to do a little bit digging. I should have looked at this before the call. So, you know, of the items that we ended up having to defer for the MVC, I know that having a visual representation of the issues that have been created off of vulnerability was something that was uh, discussed, but I honestly can't remember right now if this was something that was in place, is, is in place right now, or if we're working on it in 13.0, or if it got deferred to 13.1. So this will either be an update to what's already there, a consideration for when that work gets implemented or a oh shit we totally forgot to do that and we don't have a ticket created anywhere for it but i don't think it's the latter of the three um since we only so we have two engineers on the call right now between alexander and aviel do you guys have any questions around the scope of this or the uh requests you know just from that planning breakdown perspective do you guys think it's too big or too small thoughts I am not sure that we're getting that information around whether the issue is open or closed. Um, I know with the vulnerabilities, there's definitely a possibility or definitely the option to grab uh, the link to the issue. Uh, I just don't know about the status. I'd have to look into that. So there could be some back end work here if that's not a data point we already have available to us. Yeah, you probably don't wanna don't wanna chain the, the calls would probably make it slow to render. But yeah, something to check. Do you want me to go find that out? Um I can I can find that out. This is cool. the dashboard's all populated by GraphQL, so uh maybe there is a I can just add something to the GraphQL query that returns the issue data. I think the field is called state that you can add, that'll tell you. Awesome. So we're uh, kind of venturing into grooming a little bit. Do you think that uh, this can be completed in one iteration? Kind of going back to what our definition of what we're trying to achieve in planning breakdown, you know, our big questions are, are the requirements clear enough to understand the intent? Do we know the boundaries? of the work and is the research and solution validation complete? Do we think that we can check off all three of these answers for this particular issue? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I need to do a little bit of research, but um, the other two are good. Okay. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I don't think this would be very much work. Okay, so again, we still have time for grooming. This is really just looking at, are we gonna have to reach out to some other group to, to complete this or, you know, do we have database considerations, things like that. So 
Um, I think that this one we can move on and I can take the action after this to put this. We do have a workflow of refinement now, which is the next step. We were previously using a label called needs grooming in addition to the planning breakdown state, but somebody created the refinement workflow state that we're going to start to use. So I'll go ahead and update that after this call. We have two more items from today's agenda. This one's a little bit larger. And it, I'll let Matt speak to it. Cool. So this is part of a, a larger epic, which the intent is to start moving towards providing more, um, we'll say, rich information and scanner specific details. This is both for our internal scanners, so there are definitely structural differences in, let's say, DAST versus SAS in the type of information we get back. So once you get beyond the common things that we're hoping come from all the scanners, like a description of severity level and some of the basic identifiers like a CVE, we need a way where the scanners, either our internal teams or even third parties. So we do have um, a very limited number of official security integration partners. We'd like to add a lot more. Customers ask us all the time. They say, I have you know, XYZ scanner I'm already paying for. I would love to integrate that with GitLab, have it run in my pipeline, see it all one place. That's a big part of our value prop. So this is about extending the new standalone vulnerability pages to give them an area where we can actually put some of this information in sort of a generic structure where we don't have to predefine everything. We don't, we don't want to have to be the bottleneck every time somebody has a new um, you know, piece of data to add. So how, wait, how would the scanner integrate into the standalone vulnerability page? Would there just, would this, I guess this would be in the GitLab YAML? Uh, don't then, worry about the scanner integration part for this at all. So there's a whole separate process that partners have to go through to become a, you know, we call them, you know, a certified or an official partner. We actually only have one that's completed that. Part of that is they have to follow, they have to use our APIs and follow our integration model. Um, really that's all to say they are effectively doing the same thing that we're asking of our own internal scanners. They are outputting a, the common report JSON structure, and they we've you know defined fields where they've got some flexibility, but they're basically putting things in the right place. This is more about there being even today we have things in the JSON artifact that we're not exposing in the front end, and there are the intent is to pull more of that information and make it available to the user as well as having so that last column you can kind of see it there in our explanation the general section provide it so the third party is effectively we're giving them a block in the JSON structure that's like stuff goes here. And then we're just sort of trying to parse that out and display it in a, you know, a minimally structured way. Okay. So with this, these external scanners would, would they, they're creating their own vulnerabilities then, correct? Correct. I see. And so these ex these third party scanners are just creating vulnerabilities and then they they're we're, they're using our API to um I guess populate the vulnerabilities table and then we would just pull vulnerabilities like we would normally. Is that correct? Uh to be honest, I don't know how this is going to go with the transition. So we do only have one vendor um who is aware they, I think it was 12.8, I first engaged them and so they've been following the work. I don't know if they're gonna have to populate that directly. Is that what our scanners today are doing or are we actually parsing the JSON from the artifacts that they leave as the pipeline completes? That's a great question, I do not know. Uh, second, I believe. Okay, that, that's kind of what I thought. So they're, the vendors are still they will output from their tool a JSON artifact that matches our common report format and they are placing it in the right location um, so that it gets picked up like it would 
for our baked in, you know, a SAS, the DASP, the dependency scanners. So for their perspective, there really shouldn't be much that changes. Um, and this is just as much about like, you know, for instance, the, the DAS scanners, the type of information they may want to display is not the same as a SAS scanner. So we, there's not really a way that we can have sort of a common you know, superstructure. Fuzzing is another big sort of what if. Um, it's not going to be vulnerabilities per se, it's going to be here are things that cause particular endpoints or APIs to crash. So how can we give them a way to display that that's sort of a common uh, without having to have a crazy report, common report format that explicitly defines all the possible permutations for all the scanner possibilities, if that makes sense. Right, so, so, so sort of like a, a standalone vulnerability page specific, specifically for the vulnerabilities from SAS and DAS and fuzzing and so I don't want to go down that route. I guess what I'm yeah. saying is, so Lindsay, could you go back to the previous image you just had pulled up there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So see that other block? So there's going to be additional information in, in the, um, I, I forget what it's called today. One of, the, one of the fields, I think it's just a, I don't know if it's an array or just it's it's like a basically a freeform key value pair section and yeah. so that's sort of like the other stuffs we would just display all the key value pairs in that other section like the literal other section because everything at the top should be common across the scanner type so it's whatever they choose to put into that section of the json artifact we would just parse it and display it here i see got it thank you So basically, okay. data will fit into buckets that we already have. Yeah. And if they don't, it's just a matter of displaying it sort of generically at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Exactly. My question, Matt, is that you've got a lot of different, you know, steps involved in this process. Are we really looking at sort of the lowest priority or are these not in order? I'm, some of the questions that Alexander is asking about how we're going to get this data, are they accomplished in some of these earlier issues that are associated with this epic? They shouldn't be. So this one, while the work was all done at the same time, it kind of fell out as a standalone. So the other things really are a progression. This is all from the dashboard, or sorry, the list view. And it is sort of working from, actually, I think we can see this multi-select wasn't even a thing, but how can you select more than one vulnerability and start grouping things together. And that's what those top five items are all about is the mechanics of if I have integrated a third party scanner, let's say I have a third party SAS scanner, but I also continue to run the GitLab SAS scanners. There's a really good chance, well, I would hope there would be, that we would find a lot of the same things. So in that case, if I want both the scanners to run, I want to make sure that I can group like things together so that I'm only having to deal with one, you know, instance. So that's what all the other five are about. This is the detail page itself. It's kind of a separate thing. Okay. So if we were to accomplish the issue for the detail page, would customers already be able to configure those third party scanners to take advantage of this work today or are there dependencies on to be able to on being able to do that on other work i believe the format supports what we have conceived here today so it's up to the vendor and even our own internal scanners to structure the information in that sort of you know extra content block however they want in the json file so a customer that is working with one of our you know, our, our preferred integration partners, conceivably they're already doing that. Now they could change and clean up the structure a little bit. We wouldn't have to do any work. That's why we were trying to make this sort of a generic block for additional content. That, that was my question. So the, there are no proposed schema changes. There's a comment from, uh, from Mathieu about uh, a suggested schema, but we're not looking at any of that. Well, this is, in other words, this is a front end and UX design uh, issue. Assuming that we've got the endpoint to pull what's already there, uh, the additional fields in the JSON file, and assuming it's also populated into the vulnerability object 
table in the database, then yes. Cool. Let's just validate those assumptions then. Yeah. Write it <laughs> so we need, that's, that's my question. And I think that you did a better job of phrasing it, Tiago. Is that work, you know, those assumptions that you're describing representing, represented in this issue, or do we need another issue for that, uh, getting the data in the database and, you know, reading that third party scanner data that we can test against? I think I may have kind of confused the issue a little bit too. So when I originally wrote this, I was thinking that third parties really were very much different than what we do with our own scanners. I think this is equally as much about our own scanners have very different needs when it comes to the detailed information that they want to display on the vulnerability. So this is just for anybody that doesn't have in or that has information that falls outside of the basic you know, the, the severity, the CVE, a short description, and then, then, you know, what's the scanner name? Gotcha. Okay, can, can you click on that first uh, image again? Yeah. Okay, all right. I think this image is a little bit different than what's or is this the project level? I don't know. This vulnerability page looks, standalone vulnerability page looks a little different. But yeah, the, the front end work seems straightforward as long as those assumptions are correct. So, Tiago, can you take the action on those assumptions or do you want to work with me on that? I, I got a comment in the issue and I'll, I'll follow up. Great. Thank you. Okay, so from a planning breakdown perspective, that's a big understanding the boundaries and is this uh, a work size to where we can fit it into one iteration. Um, I feel like we're probably gonna wanna revisit this in a week. I mean, I'm really glad you're here, Aviel, don't get me wrong, but I know you're not permanently on these dashboards or, or working on standalone vulnerabilities or vote insights with us long-term. So I would like to re revisit this conversation and we have some of the backend engineers from Defend on this call as well. So we only have one other issue and we have one more minute. And I think this issue will hopefully be very, very quick because we've already done this twice. So this is the third of our uh, export reports. Uh, this would be the group level report. We've done this for the project instance levels already. We're looking to, I'm not actually sure why I still have this on this list. It's still in design and we have a weight on it. Um, I think I just messed up. So I don't know if we need to actually talk about this one. I think we might be all right with it. Is it that we maybe we didn't have a screenshot or a mock for this specific view? Because I know the headers are a little bit different on each of the dashboards. That's a good question. And about the weight, we, we had agreed that we're going to add up back end and front end. Oh, weight. never mind. We got them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's take that bit offline, Tiago. We can do that. Um, Sounds good. But yeah, no, I recall your conversation. So yeah, we do have design, so I think that's covered. So I think we're good. Um, but Tiago, let's wrap, let's look back around on that weight question, uh, you and I, okay? Because we are at the end of the hour. Thanks everybody.